Hello, uh, welcome to the NIHR Dementia Researcher Midday Lecture webinars. A um, little bit past midday today, uh, but that's mostly because I'm delighted to be joined by Joanna Sun. Uh, hi, Joanna. Hello. And um, that's because, as we've just learned, Joanna is in Tasmania uh, in Australia. And um, she's a PhD candidate at the University of Wollongong, and her research focuses on dementia-enabling environments. Uh, Joanna has developed an environmental assessment tool for facilities providing dementia care um, for use in Singapore and she's passionate about designing environments that can enable and empower and enhance the quality of life of people with uh, living with dementia in residential care particularly but in their own home as well I'm sure. Um, mm. And I know that this is something that systems across the world have been trying to uh, work on and improve. Um, so we're delighted to have uh, Joanna joining us today to present her research into utilizing some of these some of these tools we're talking about. Uh, the tool, the talk will last about 20 minutes and then we have allowed 10 minutes for questions at the end. If you have any questions, you can post these at any time using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and I will put those to uh, uh, Joe, who will answer them at the end of the talk. Um, we are recording today's lecture, so if you drop out, don't worry, you can access this back via our website later. Um, so thank you very much, everybody, for joining us now. And um, Joanna, if you'd like to share your screen now, you can make a start. Thank you. Cool. And thanks for having me. That's all right. Thank you. So I'll, I'll just give a little introduction um, about myself. So. Um, my name is Joanna Sun, and I'm a PhD candidate from the University of Wollongong in New South Wales, Australia. Um, I work as a consultant helping people to develop dementia-enabling environments. And this may range from care homes, uh, art galleries, to transport hubs. So I wear many hats. Um, I also work as a social media coordinator for the Wicking Dementia Research Centre, or Research and Education Centre here in Tasmania, where I live. So. Today, I'm going to share with you a part of my study. Uh, this is an initial phase of my study where I look to co-design and collaborate with Singaporeans to find out if the Australian Environmental Assessment Tool, um, High Care, is appropriate and can be adapted for a Singaporean population. So like I mentioned, this is part of a larger study um, which resulted in the development of the Singaporean environmental assessment tool that's validated and it can be used to assess high care facilities in Singapore. So for this webinar, um, I'm going with this structure because I know there may be um, individuals who are interested in specific parts of this webinar. So at least you get a feel of what's going to happen. So we'll just go with the background and I'll tell you a little bit about the Australian Environmental Assessment Tool High Care, um, a little bit about the big picture so, and where this study sits in the entire adaptation process, um, the study itself and some of the findings and conclusions. So just a little bit of background about Singapore. So if you haven't been to Singapore, uh, Singapore is a small island. Uh, in Southeast Asia, and it houses, houses a, a multiracial population of about 5.6 million people, um, of which about half a million are older adults age 65 and above. Uh, so you can see we are facing an aging population. And in 2015, we have about 45,000 Singaporeans living with dementia, and this is set to increase to 103,000. So it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of going up. So if we have a, a number of facilities providing high levels of care, of dementia care in, in Singapore. Um, and when I started this study in 2015, um, a lot of them were uh, quite pathogenic in design, so quite hospital-like, a lot of emphasis more on the treatment of diseases. And um, for those who are in um, dementia research, you know that hospital-like environments are uh, yeah, they're not conducive environments for people living with dementia. Um, and there's a lot of negative stimulation and they pay very little attention to the cultural aspects of care. So for facilities that wanna make a change um, or nursing homes, if we call some of them in Singapore, um, yeah, if they wish to incorporate a dementia enabling design, how would they know systematically that they're doing it right? Um, 
are they, you know, are they enabling for residents living with dementia? Are they empowering for staff? Are they culturally appropriate? So these are some of the questions um, that the people on the ground are asking. So we look to a tool, I guess, when we, we looked at developing a tool, we wanted a tool that's, um, th that can provide a reliable platform of communication um, that can, and well, a platform of communication and evaluation basically. So for all stakeholders in Singapore, because we know designing um, a high care facility, it's not, like only the architects, it's, it's not just the um, designers, it's a whole range of people. You need to talk to the staff, you need um, people that are doing operations, you need the administrators, you need the policy makers. So it's, it's really a whole range of people that need to understand what comes together to design such a facility. And also we need to find out from people living with dementia and their families as well, what, what do they want in these environments? So yeah, so I guess in a way, a tool like this will help to address all these challenges that are faced by residents living with dementia in Singapore um, and their families, you know, and staff who are, I guess, trying to work in environments that are quite pathogenic. And a tool like this can help to identify the strengths and weaknesses of the environments being used. And they can use a tool like that to systematically improve the environment. So you can see here, um, I've just done um, just a little figure to show what we want the tool to achieve. So yeah, so we want to provide a measure of application. We want the tool to be able to enhance the knowledge of dementia enabling environments, um, ensure the promotion of salutogenic design. So design that is uh, that has health and well-being in mind and that's culturally appropriate. So just a little bit about the Australian Environmental Assessment Tool, uh, High Care. So there's, there are a few versions of this tool. Um, I've got the website up on the slide, so you can actually visit that site to check out the tool. So the Environmental Assessment Tool, High Care, or EHC, um, it's actually based on the original Environmental Assessment Tool, which is called EAT. Uh, it's designed by Richard Fleming and Kirsty Bennett. You can, yeah, you can see their names on the, um, the little booklet there. So it's a tool that's inclusive um, of people living dementia who may be mobile or those requiring end of life care. Um, so the EHC, uh, we did a, a study, a scoping review earlier. So myself and Richard Fleming, um, and we found that it was the best available to, to provide a standardized assessment uh, to guide and evaluate these high care facilities. And this tool is it's great because it is right now it's it's well this it's sorry it's commonly used in Australia and it's recommended by the Australian Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission for use by aged care providers that want to meet um, building standards. So if you want to look into it, the link is there. It's um, standard five of the Australian aged care quality standards. Uh, and this guide basically, uh, it's the EAT HC, sorry, it's designed to guide the users through an evaluation of the built environment against the eight principles of design. So there are eight principles of design that make up the foundation um, of this tool. And they have, the, the principles have their origins in Australia, where they have informed the development of specialized dementia care units and the evaluation of residential aged care environments since the 1980s. So it's been around for pretty much three decades and it can be used by multiple stakeholders as well. So this is the um, key design principle. So you can see from one to eight. So this actually, um, when we started this study in 2015, 2016, there were only eight key design principles. These principles have expanded. The current updated versions, you can see that there's 10 principles. Um, basically, principle four, managed level of stimulation has been split into a positive and negative. 
Um, and then for principle seven, um, provide opportunities to be alone, that's one. And then uh, there's another one that is with others from the community. So both number four and number seven have been split into two. So you have 10 principles instead of eight. So the aim of this study basically is to prepare the way for the adaptation of this tool for the use of Singapore by investigating if these eight principles that you see here are an appropriate foundation for the development of a Singaporean version. And we also want to identify if there are any culturally specific characteristics um, that needs to be included uh, in the adapted version of the tool. So just a, an idea of what um, the differences between in the built environment between both countries. So like I live in Tasmania and you can see it's, it's vastly different. So in Singapore, you get a lot of high rise, high density living. Um, in Tasmania, Australia, you see a lot of, yeah, just a lot of low rise houses. Um, so it's just looking at the differences in the building characteristics. It's, it's quite obvious that there will be, um, I guess some, yeah, some differences that will come up when you talk to Singaporeans about how they live and the buildings in which they live in. So just to give everybody an overview of the bigger picture of the project, um, if you see the bit that says phase one, and then this is data collection, um, and then inference results in interpretation as a little blue line there. So that's where this study stands. So this study is really part of the first phase where we carried out, after we carried out a scoping review, and uh, we want to seek basically evidence from Singaporeans if the eight principles of design um, are appropriate. So we carried out a series of 23 focus groups conducted in 2016 um, and the thematic data available from the focus group discussions were supplemented with um, quantitative descriptive data obtained through the use of Likert scales, uh, which were used to report the judgment, judgments on the level of appropriateness of each principle to the Singaporean context. So I'll expand on this a little bit. So for those who, who wish to carry out studies of a diverse cohort, um, perhaps in Asia or in Singapore, so based on the literature and evidence um, and my experience in carrying out focus groups, um, we found that it's actually quite useful if when you have the focus groups to actually have maybe a, a printout or a handout that people can also um, write their thoughts down or if you want them to basically, like for example, with a seven point Likert scale, when you ask somebody from scale one to 10, um, what do you feel, um, whether you agree or strongly disagree, blah, 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 they may not actually give you an accurate um, an answer. So they kind of, yeah, within the focus group, when we collected a lot of the verbal uh, verbatim data, people kind of um and ah about it. And they, yeah, so you don't actually, uh, you may not get an answer. Uh, so we also provided participants, yeah, with a handout so they can actually write down. So we get, get the answers really clearly. Um, yeah, and it also helps with some of the participants as, as well who um, may, not ha may not have English as their first language. They may not feel as confident to contribute, but they wish to still participate in the study. So in this way, um, we, well, I found that during the study, a lot of participants uh, whose English is not their first language, they were um, quite good at contributing a lot of the feedback on paper. So for each question um, during the focus group discussion, I actually gave um, participants time to actually, if they wish to write down the answers instead to do that. Um, so at least they have the option of, uh, yeah, um, participating verbally or they can write it down. And sometimes this helps to address cultural sensitivities as well, um, like collectiv collectivism. So these are some of the key considerations um, when 
undertaking focus groups with um, an Asian community. And some participants have mentioned that, you know, it, they feel that they may be impolite or maybe irrelevant. So they may not wish to verbally express their thoughts. Um, so yeah, offering, I guess, the, the option of having to write it down during the focus group um, definitely helped collect like a lot more responses than what I would have if I had gone with just the verbal responses. As the intention is to have this Singaporean tool to be used by all stakeholders um, involved in the planning design and operation um, process, the focus group basically involved individuals from different ethnicities and different care settings, um, as well as people involved in um, planning policy, management or design of the built environment. So you can see here, it's quite a big, um, quite a diverse group, um, not just the age range, but yeah, the different backgrounds as well. So yes, we basically recruited 150 participants and ran 23 focus groups. And the group seems quite representative of the industry. So we, with 79% um, of participants being female and a large number of them coming from uh, the aged care sector with a nursing background. So here's some results. Um, so the process of analysis um, that we, we carried out basically began as soon as the discussions um, we carried out the discussions in a focus group. So uh, we made notes um, on the perceptions, on their perceptions, group behavior, their body language, um, some of the repetitive themes and concepts that arose from each of the focus groups. Um, all the audio data collected were transcribed verbatim and we use MVivo 11. Uh, so for those who are not familiar with MVivo, um, it's a software used in analysis of rich text centric qualitative data. Um, and basically we, the process of open coding was repeated using NVivo and a code book was created. So upon completion of the code book, um, key concepts are drawn out until we attain conceptual saturation. And so yeah, here you can see, um, if you have a look, so I've popped at the bottom, one from one strongly disagree to seven strongly agree. You can see that a lot of the participants, um, they either agree or strongly, strongly agree with each of the principles um, that they were appropriate um, in the adaptation of the tool. I've got some pictures here. It's not a, um, uh, it's not a tourism feature sort of promotion thing, but just to give uh, the audience an idea of what. Singapore looks like. Um, so a lot of Singaporeans, 80% of Singaporeans live in um, high rise apartments or high rise flats. And 80% of Singaporeans as well associate with a religion. And it's quite a high density uh, country. And there's a large or quite high um, smartphone usage as well as um, I guess usage of technology in general across the board. So no surprises here. So from the study, basically we found that um, the items that we need to address that were not found, I guess, within the EHC um, were technology, palliative care, and spirituality. These were the three key themes that we need to address in the adaptation of the tool. So I'll just do a quick run through the findings so you can see how um, it formulates and how um, participants uh, envision what the environment can be and what the current characteristics of the built environment um, is like. So for example, the first one, un unobtrusively reduced risk. Um, a lot of participants in indicated mixed feelings about balancing risk and safety measures uh, because currently a lot of participants are familiar with more of a pathogenic sort of design, a more hospital-like design. Um, but participants do recognize that obtrusive design impinges on the dignity of the residents. And they have highlighted that residents are displaced and disempowered. Um, so they do agree that this principle is very much needed um, 
yeah, in the two and four residents in Singapore. Participants have also suggested that we need to utilize technology. Perhaps technology can um, be one component that could help us, I guess, unobtrusively reduce risk. So the second one, uh, you can see provide, provide a human scale. So participants are quick to highlight that there's cultural differences between Australia and Singapore when it comes to density, um, as well as size of buildings. So a lot of um, participants note that they're actually quite comfortable with um, vertical designs and high-rise buildings. And they are also open to sharing a room with one other person. It was necessary to have an understanding um, that there were such differences in the familiarity for Singaporeans when it came to the built environment and the way in which they lived. And the next one I'll talk about is allowing people to see and be seen. So staff observed that in facilities, there's very little visual access to enable navigation orientation for residents. Um, and much of it is due to the design and layout. So a lot of um, participants have also requested if technology can assist with the process. Um, so if we have a, an open environment that can enable residents to um, move around safely, if, yeah, basically if there's some sort of technology we can use to enable, um, I guess, to monitor movement, to enable safety. And in terms of managing stimulation, uh, same thing again with technology. So they're asking if there's some sort of techno technological aids to help with lighting, temperature, surveillance, sound control um, in the homes. And if technology can also come in to help with sensory stimulation or reminiscence therapy, music therapy, et cetera. And all these can only be done if the build environment supports technology. For example, some homes may not have Wi-Fi or Wi-Fi may not be available to residents. So if, yeah, if there's no, if the build environment have, doesn't have a way to enable technology, then um, none of this can actually be implemented. So supporting movement and engagement. So residents basically, um, they're quite uh, comfortable with, yeah, like I said before, vertical design. Um, but they wanted to find out if there were better ways, if there's better facility design that can enable residents to travel in between floors. So again, technology. So this, this is quite a, a big theme that keeps coming up repeatedly. So for number six, create a familiar place. So for this one, spirituality plays quite a big role because like I mentioned before, 80% of Singaporeans associate uh, themselves with a religion. And um, a lot of participants um, wanted some way to include uh, cultural or religious artifacts that can con contribute to home-like or familiar environment. And um, if that can be implemented so it can contribute to the resident's sense of identity um, and even sp spaces, for example, like uh, one of the examples was the Heathrow Airport. Um, one of the participants shared that Heathrow Airport has a multi-faith prayer room and they were suggesting if there could be something similar uh, to have a, a multi-faith prayer room, maybe have some um, storage spaces where you can put different religious artifacts in so that people from different um, religions, yeah, when they can um, basically modify the room um, according to uh, the spiritual needs. And we have provide opportunities to be alone um, with other residents or with others from the community. So for this, there was a lot of um, call for action for designs uh, requesting for spaces for caregivers to visit. So some caregivers shared there was, when they visited these high care facilities, they did not have any private spaces. So they may have to sit, um, for example, a participant had to sit on her, uh, when visiting a grandfather, had to either sit on the bed or stand. Um, and it was quite uncomfortable because she did not feel 
um, that it was right for her to be standing and looking down at her grandfather. And she felt that was quite rude. So um, that kind of put up a bit of a, um, it brought about some issues for her with visiting because um, she wanted to visit her grandfather. But at the same time, yeah, not having private spaces to sit down and, and talk to your loved ones, um, that was quite confronting for her. And this also leads to uh, requests for spaces for palliative care, because a lot of the designs, like I said before, are ward, hospital-like or ward-like. So there's not much privacy between the beds um, for nursing staff to actually carry out palliative care. So um, a lot of the staff have, or participants were nursing staff, requested that um, perhaps there may be some items in the Singapore inversion that can help um, help with the design of spaces for palliative care. And for the last point, support the values and goals of care. So for this, a lot of participants have noted that um, the model of care in the facilities may not match with the design. So basically, they may be trying to deliver a person-centered model of care, um, but with trying to squeeze it into an environment that's hospital-like um, and providing the sort of long-term care, a lot of participants found that quite, um, they felt that they were being caught in a bind. So these are some of the barriers and facilitators, um, like I mentioned before. So there's, there's a need for a de definition of a nursing home for dementia care. And there needs to be an increase of understanding of the role and environment in dementia care, as well as one that promotes social inclusion and citizenship. So for instance, right now, a lot of um, the facility design, um, there's no input from families uh, or people living with dementia in Singapore. So, yeah, so just to conclude, um, participants will view that the application of the principles of design and facilities providing high levels of care for people living with dementia would enable residents to have better quality of life and care. The implementation of the principles would provide well, significant benefits and they can promote inclusion for residents, staff, families, and people in the community. And with that sal salutogenic design, um, a sense of positive well-being. So the evidence in this study sets the foundation for the development of the Singaporean version of the EHC. The results basically enable the second phase of the study. And with that, we've developed the Singapore Environmental Assessment Tool. Um, and it's developed with an accompanying user guide. So there's a slight difference. Uh, we also noticed because of the difference in understanding of dementia, the Australian version, they have a, a guidebook. Whereas for the Singaporean version, we have a user guide. So it actually provides information on each item. Um, and basically provides an explanation of um, what the item addresses and how to score the items as well. So yeah, that's all I have for you today. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. That was fascinating. Thank you very much. So I was quite interested to know um, when we look at um, environment, what were the, I mean, obviously, it, could this tool be broadened out further to consider factors about people living in their own home particularly as well and the kind of changes that you might make to make somebody's own home more suitable for the the changes as that could that come with the the disease so with the um i guess the foundation principles actually just looking at the the eight principles that was discussed there that can be applied to any any environment so whether it's a home environment uh, whether it's an build environment in the community, you can actually just look at, um, yeah, basically it's 10 now, but you're basically the principles of design and apply that. Um, we actually do have different tools for different environments um, because um, I guess, yeah, so you, we actually have a dementia um, tool for communities and then we have homes as well. So the EAT actually is more for home-like environments, um, whereas the EHC is quite specific to the high care aspect. So we do have slightly different um, uh, items in it for, yeah, basically to meet the different environments. Yeah, 
I mean, you can see how this is particularly useful because I, I don't know about um, elder care facilities in Australia, but in the UK, uh, care homes are commercial businesses that are always trying to uh, look at occupancy rates and how they can yes. attract more people to want to choose to live and be cared for the, in, in their facility over over somebody else's and I think if they were able to say that they they'd gone through the assessment tool and they'd reviewed environments and that they could meet this this could almost be mm. uh, sold to them or encouraged to use them as a as a bit of a promotional tool because if they if you had this standardized where you could compare in that way I think it would attract mm people to to want to live there potentially mm, it's like a exactly part of that kind of that rating system that could also then be built into uh, any regulatory authority Theresa Atkinson uh, ha asks how long would it take someone to use the tool uh, in an environment um, and uh, she presumes it can be used by any stakeholders so it depends on the user so if they're familiar with the environment um, participant feedback during testing, uh, some of them were able to use the tool within 45 minutes. Um, if, uh, and the longest was if they were in a really unfamiliar environment, never been there before, just a drop in, uh, it can be up to an hour and a half. So, yeah. do, you, do you think that you, you would make certain adapt uh, adaptions to compensate for different types of dementia as well? So we know, for example, people with uh, PCA, for example, uh, or Parkinson's or, or Parkinson's with Alzheimer's might have slightly different issues with environment. At the moment, it's, I guess it's quite all encompassing. Um, perhaps in the future, there might be somewhere we can move into. Because I think at the moment, um, even just the use of the environmental tool and the knowledge of it, because like in this study, um, I did find that you may have people that have knowledge of dementia care, but it, it doesn't equate to having an understanding of the environment um, or dementia enabling environments. So I think we still have a little bit of, yeah, we still have, I wouldn't say a long way to go, but we'll still, yeah, have to work on that. Mm. And, and, I, and I think as well, there is this element of potentially looking at uh, the personalization. Obviously, person-centered mm. care is, is something that uh, every, everybody strives for and, and has become a bit of a buzzword for, for good high quality standards of care um, mm. and I think environment is a key one I, I know um, I was talking to somebody from a nursing home uh, recently who had quite a comprehensive list of questions that they asked people when they moved in as yep. residents not just to understand if they spent you know do they like to sit at a dining table or eat from a tray or even things like um, their cleaning habits so I think they'd They'd found a, a lady had moved in with them who was quite used to doing her own dusting and vacuuming and polishing the brass. And um, they'd had some challenges where those things were generally done for you. And so this lady didn't even have access to, for example, the cleaning cupboard. So she could get her own duster and do things. And I think uh, this a nursing home had addressed this by having quite a lot of questions to understand to try and make life in this this new way as close to life at, at home could be um so i mean obviously that goes slightly beyond um physical environment but it, it it is still linked because things like do you have access to a cleaning cupboard where do your shoes get kept and where do you look for for these things i think are all factors in so um that's actually a really good point because my background, I was an, a nurse and I used to do all the taking the history and everything when people come into the aged care facility. So there are actually really good designs out there. For example, if you want people to access a couple, like for example, yeah, a person that maybe, you know, she does a lot of all her laundry and stuff by herself at home. And if you want a person to access something, you can have like the cupboards and then you can have like the see through um, sort of acrylic, kind of little windows so they can open yeah so they'll access the stuff that they can see and they can help themselves to items and yeah basically helps them to engage in the activity yeah. so you put them strategically where they can see them um and then yeah for cupboards or items that you don't want to don't want them to access because they may be dangerous um you can camouflage these and blend it in with the walls so yeah hmm. so like yeah. that's a really good point and yeah, and I think it can be, you know, it can be 
uh, difficult to move from you know kind of a house into a into a room where mm. you know your bed and how, where you eat and all these things are all in the same place and particularly if also as well not everybody wants to you know, I know my grandparents never ate out in restaurants or cafes or anything like that. And the idea of mm. them eating meals in front of other people um, yep. rather than mm. privately eating in their own space was difficult. But but in the nursing home they moved into, there, there wasn't an, an ability to eat in your own mm. room and in your space. And that was that was difficult. Um, we've got a few more questions here. Uh, Theresa Atkinson oh, right. asks if you could share your slides. Um, if you right. want to post those to me, I'll, I'll happily um, yep. post those a link to those as well. So hopefully that helps Teresa. Um, yep. Teresa also makes an observation. She doesn't think uh, environments need to be specific for different types of dementia, uh, but good environments for people with dementia would support everybody in that place, including those with, with no disabilities. Um, thank you. Uh, 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 Johnny. Uh, Joni asks, great talk. What would you say is the key factor for implementing these guidelines? I mean, moving them from paper to practice. And do you know if Australia has any study evaluating the implementation of uh, Eat HC? Uh, I believe there is a knowledge translation framework. Uh, if I can send the information through, um, yeah, um, for them to have a look. I've also got a, a knowledge translation framework done up for implementation as well. So um, I've got an available poster that's quick and easy um, for stakeholders to see how they can um, implement. Basically, if they, yeah, if they've got a tool, how can they implement and make it sustainable? Because I think it's um, no surprise, like a lot of people that work in the HK industry, you know, you train a bunch of people, they all know how to use this tool, and then you get turnover, you know, and stuff like that. And then yeah, it kind of gets lost in the mix. Um, so yeah, so basically I do have a, a knowledge translation framework that organizations can take up to make sure that they can sustain the use of um, the tool and basically ensure that there's a, a consistency and continuation um, of basically utilizing the environment or and supporting the residents and staff as well, so yeah. Yeah, I, I would completely agree. Uh, turnover of staff here in the UK in care homes and nursing homes is huge. And I think embedding something in such a way, whereas um, it can it, it can manage with the loss of corporate knowledge as people move mm -hmm. on is, is tricky. So making it something that's embedded as part of a routine, a room check, you know, even things we, we've I've worked previously on healthcare associated infections and looking at cleaning audits and 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 hand hygiene audits and things like that it's it's you could see this being embedded as one of those things that would just be mm. regularly looked at yep. um and also as well a way of keeping up to date with the guidance that's out there because i think the thing is is that these things change so frequently whereas you mm. you'll assess against what is a good standard today and in 12 months time things will have changed so keeping that up to date mm. is important too I hope that's answered your question. Uh, we've got a question from Mary O'Malley who asks, were there any discussions relating to outdoor space? More generally, is there a difference in the type of outdoor spaces available in care facilities in Singapore versus Australia? Example, gardens and bal yeah, gardens versus balconies. Yes, yeah, so there was some interesting um, feedback and um, actually suggestions in terms of outdoor spaces because of the vertical living. Um, people were requesting if they can have gardens in pockets. So for example, if you have one floor, um, so if you imagine an apartment, like you can have a rooftop garden, but apparently a, a rooftop garden may not be used um, as, as much because it may be quite hot. Like, I guess this is for a Singapore context. It may be different for a different country, but it may be really hot um, on the roof, so for the rooftop garden. So a lot of older adults may not, go up to use the garden so they were requesting to see more of like just little pocket gardens on the same floor that residents can access um, because the other thing is um, if you have like a rooftop garden or a, a huge garden downstairs for an outdoor just one giant outdoor space uh, yeah you've got to go up and down the lifts and yeah that will take forever um, so yeah I, and I hope and I in that Australia, you'd imagine that obviously, I, I imagine it's not so much multi-story as your picture. Mm, very you just walk out. Demonstrated <laughs> exactly, yeah. And the gardens, 
the guns there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mary. Um, um, so I think that's the, oh no, we have one more question. Oh no, that's the last of the questions, but there are a couple of uh, thanks in there as well. Uh, Sarah Waller wanted to add her thanks and um, Shri Tan uh, says, apologies, she has to go, but uh, let, to let you know that your, your work is awesome and is very much benefiting the people Thank in you. Singapore. Uh, thank you very much uh, to uh, Joanna for joining us today and to uh, everybody uh, who joined the, the talk. Um, we're really grateful for you agreeing to share your work. Um, if you'd like to follow Joanna on Twitter, you'll find her at Design for Aged Care. That's A-G-E-D Care. Um, our next webinar is on Thursday, the 4th of June at 12 noon, where we have James Watson uh, from the University of Liverpool. Uh, James will be presenting on how to conduct a systematic review based on his, his own work in conducting a systematic review for part of his PhD. Um, the recording from today's uh, webinar and details of future webinars and how to register for James is all on our website at dementiaresearcher.nihr.ac.uk forward slash webinars. Finally, if you'd like to join us and present your own research as a webinar, please do drop us a line. You'll find us on Twitter at dem underscore researcher, or you can use the contact us page on our website. Thank you very much again, Joanna, for joining us. I, I know it's probably 1 a.m. in, <laughs> uh, in Tasmania right now. So we're very grateful and thank you everybody for joining us again. See you thank again. Thank you everyone. Thanks.